Good morning and happy Wednesday to you. I hope your semester is off to a great start and that we are managing with online learning. Just as I've said in all my emails and video lectures up to this point, please don't hesitate to contact me through email if you're having difficulty with submitting work, getting caught up in the class. I want to do everything I can to help you get off to a great start in this course and I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Uh, for today's lecture, I will be focusing on what we read leading in today, which was the introduction of outliers. I will be covering what to expect for your quiz on Friday, as I have some of those focal areas up on the board for chapter one. And then I'll also briefly explain what I expect as far as your responses and how I expect you to respond in your written work, in your class journal, and in particular for Friday's quiz. So let's begin with uh, the introduction that you were to read for today. And in the introduction of Outliers, what we have is Malcolm Gladwell, the author, making a comparison. And this is something that Gladwell does often, and in my opinion, I think it's something as a writer he does very well. Now, he doesn't always make the best comparisons, and sometimes he tries too hard to connect two things that maybe are not as connected as he thinks they are. But as far as the introduction of this book is concerned, I think he has a great comparison that sets up the argument for his book and helps us relate in a way that, at least for me personally, is familiar that I can connect to my real world experiences as a person. So in the introduction, which is titled The Rosetto Mystery, we learn about a small town in Pennsylvania uh, called Rosetto. And what we learn is that during the 1950s in the United States, heart attacks were an epidemic. And uh, heart disease, heart failure, heart attacks were one of the leading causes of death for people under the age of 65. And so Gladwell opens up with this anecdote about a physician named Stuart Wolf, who, while having a beer um, with a, another doctor there in Rosetto, comes to find out that very few people, if any, are dying of heart disease um, in this town of Rosetto, which makes Rosetto an outlier. So again, back to Gladwell's comparison and, and using Rosetto as an anecdote, it's very effective and works well because it fits the theme of the book, Rosetto being an outlier, um, an outlier being a statistical and anomaly. Um, it's something that stands out from the larger group. And Rosetto stands out again for the health of its citizens and in particular, the health of uh, its citizens as far as heart disease and heart failure are concerned. No one in Rosetto, very few people in Rosetto under the age of 65 are dying from heart disease or heart attacks. So this leads to uh, Stuart Wolf deciding to find out why. And so he conducts a famous study and back to rhetorical strategies. This is something that you will see Gladwell do throughout the chapters that we will read in this book is he is constantly referring to studies and oftentimes he's referring to well-known studies that um, are, are familiar to a larger audience or a wider population. Studies that are considered to be credible, uh, respected, academic, and scholarly. So again, back to Gladwell as a writer, something that I, in my opinion, he does very well is he's well researched and um, you can tell from reading all of his books that he dedicates an enormous amount of time to doing research for the arguments that he makes in his books for the themes that his books carry and outliers is is no exception um, gladwell is constantly referring to the research that he's done um, to support his his argument here and that makes his argument more credible and him more credible as an author, in my opinion. So as far as ethos appeal goes in this book, Gladwell isn't necessarily going to go out of his way to establish um, his character and credibility as a writer, because as you can see, 
This is a, a best-selling book. In fact, several of his books are national bestsellers. And so he doesn't necessarily need to go out of his way to establish his credibility as a writer because he's an established writer. But one way that I believe he does establish credibility with his audience is through his research, which is second to none as far as best-selling books are concerned that are reaching a wider, larger audience. His, his research as a writer is, is second to none. So back to Rossetto, uh, Stuart Wolf decides to do this study to find out, find out why the citizens of this town are, are not experiencing any heart disease. And the assumption early on is that it has to be the genetics or the makeup of the citizens in this town. It has to be they have good genetics. They are, they are healthy people from the old world in Europe that have immigrated from Italy to the United States. So it must be something about who these Italian Americans are as people. It must be their genetic makeup um, as, as the reason to why uh, they are so healthy. And so through, through the study that Stuart Wolf conducts, he finds out, in fact, it doesn't have so much to do with their genetics or their diet or what they're eating, but it has more to do with the lifestyle that they live. And both Stuart Wolf and, and Gladwell highlight this lifestyle in explaining that Rosetto is this very commu community-oriented town. In other words, it's, it's a community in the truest sense of the word where people look out for one another. Um, they mention details like walking through the town. It's not uncommon for people um, to be seen greeting one another, being friendly, going out of their way to help one another. Another detail that Gladwell highlights is that uh, you find a lot of three generational households in Rosetto at this time. Three generational households, meaning that grandparents and parents are both present in the household, which helps in the raising of children. Um, grandparents being present helps um, alleviate some of the stress that parents have in raising their own kids, um, especially parents that have jobs oftentimes rely on their parents to help raise their kids. So when I think of Rosetto, as I read the introduction of this book, I think of the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. And um, in other words, we should all be community oriented and we should all be aware of how important environment, the environment that surrounds our children is to their success as they grow up and become adults. And it's, it's definitely a lesson to be learned from the town of Rosetto in the sense of we should all be community oriented. We should be a society that looks out for one another um, and especially as far as the well-being of our children is concerned, we should very much be aware of how um, it, it's our responsibility as community members to look out for our fellow citizens. And uh, the responsibility of a raising a child just doesn't fall on the parents of that child. It's, it's the teachers. It's um, the members of a society that interact with uh, people and, and children daily. Um, the environment that surrounds an individual is extremely important as far as um, success is concerned, and in this case, as far as the health of Rosetto's citizens is concerned. So um, another thing that comes to mind is, as I think of Rosetto, I just think of a very stress-free environment. And as you all get older, you're going to realize, if you don't realize already, that stress is a killer, especially in our society in the United States. Um, stress has a huge, impact on your mental and your physical health. And as I'm sure some of you are already aware, your mental and your physical health are, are connected. And so um, stress is, is something that we experience on the daily, especially in a capitalist um, society like the United States. And um, in contrast, Rosetto to me um, feels like a very stress-free environment. And living in a stress-free environment definitely has some, some benefits on a person's uh, health. So at the end of the chapter, we get the final sentence and quote from Malcolm Gladwell in which he states, in outliers, I want to do for our understanding of success what Stuart Wolf did for our understanding of health, which is he wants us to look past the individual and think of the environment 
that surrounds an individual and what effect and impact um, the surroundings of an individual have on the person. And then as far as the argument of this book is concerned, um, the background surroundings environment, the impact that those factors have on an individual's success. So that leads us right into chapter one, which um, is titled The Matthew Effect. And in, before we get to chapter one, we have part one, which is titled Opportunity. And so in the few chapters that we read um, from part one of this book, these chapters will be focused on opportunity and the role that opportunity plays in an individual's success. And um, what Gladwell is going to argue is oftentimes these opportunities an individual receives can be very arbitrary or random and not earned or deserved sometimes and could be a stroke of luck or serendipity, if you like that word. Um, he's, he's going to give examples of how a person's surroundings and the opportunities they receive can oftentimes be unwarranted, undeserved, lucky, and um, can create huge advantages um, for individuals as far as success and growing and prospering is concerned. So up on the board, I have some focus areas for chapter one that I want you to um, keep in mind and really pay attention to as you read chapter one leading into Friday's quiz. And Friday's quiz will be over the introduction in chapter one. And so up at the top of the board, I have ecology of an organism, which is a, a biology term that Gladwell uses, again, as another comparison to reinforce this argument about success. Below that, I have advantage and opportunity, which uh, I've already alluded to a bit um, as far as that being um, a big theme and focus area for Gladwell's argument in this book, how advantages, opportunities play a huge role in an individual's success. And then back to uh, logos appeal and back to, again, um, what Gladwell often does as a writer is he is going to refer to two famous studies, one by Roger Barnsley um, that focuses on youth hockey players and um, another study by Bedard and Dewey that focuses on test scores in education. And so, I think part of the appeal to chapter one for many of you is I know I have many student athletes uh, in this class. And so I think you you might relate um, to the sports comparison in this chapter, especially if you played uh, youth sports. Uh, a big part of Roger Barnsley's study is going to be how the selection process of um, of youth athletes and placing them on elite teams and different levels of teams and the way individuals receive coaching oftentimes can be unfair at the youth levels where young athletes haven't necessarily developed into their bodies yet. And we oftentimes can get caught up in young athletes who are dominating a sport because they have a huge size advantage over uh, the rest of their peers which me being a youth athlete, I can, I can very much relate to um, as I read chapter one. In fact, just a, a short anecdote, personal anecdote about me. When I was in middle school, I was a part of a, a basketball team that went undefeated from my seventh to eighth grade years. And as much as I would love to brag about that team and my ability as a basketball player, which I promise you I will never do, <laughs> Um, if I'm being honest, I have to admit one of the reasons that we went undefeated those two years as a basketball team is because we had a player on the team, our star player of the team, um, who was held back um, one year as a sixth grader. And this player on our team um, being held back had a whole year of maturity over the rest of um, the guys on our team and other basketball players he was playing against. He, he had a full year of maturity and development over everyone else. And he was a big kid in middle school. Um, and that created a huge advantage for him, which led to him getting noticed by coaches and receiving extra coaching 
and um, an extra development that I felt like the rest of the guys on, on our team didn't receive um, as much as he did. And I only bring up that story because it, it ties into Roger Barnsley's study and um, his focus on youth hockey players. So um, again, um, that, that is um, something that Gladwell, in trying to reach a wide audience, and again, this is a national best-selling book, Gladwell here is attempting to reach a large audience, and so he will um, make references and comparisons to aspects of life that are relatable for the typical reader. And in this case, um, that being youth sports, whether you're an athlete or not, most of us, whether we played youth sports or not, we're familiar with youth sports and have grown up around sports and have often participated or been involved in sports over the years. Um, the second study in comparison by Bedard and Dewey will relate to education and some similar advantages that students experience that have to do with age and maturity that are often unfair, especially at the early stages of development in education. And so, um, again, Gladwell, as a writer, is reinforcing his argument through uh, rhetorical strategies that are very much rooted in logos appeal through his um, constant references to, to studies, to facts, to logic and reasoning. And in combination with that, he will go out of his way as a writer to appeal to us as readers emotionally through anecdotes, through storytelling, and through examples that are rel relatable and familiar to a wider or larger audience. So as far as rhetoric is concerned, some food for thought, um, focus areas for your reading as we um, work our way to Friday's quiz, which will, again will be over chapter one in the introduction of Outliers. So I hope you're enjoying the book so far. I hope you're at least getting something out of it. Um, I, I know we all don't enjoy reading and um, I know reading can be a chore or a struggle for some of us. And so that's part of the reason I choose this book is because over the years, it's a book that my students um, have responded well to. It's the book that I've read over the years that has received the most positive feedback and students encouraging me to share this with future students and classes. So even if you don't necessarily enjoy reading this book, I hope you find something that you can at least relate to or something that's familiar that you can connect to the world around you. Um, it's a better digest uh, Gladwell's argument in this book. Okay, now at the bottom, I have highlighted cite the text. So it's something that I've noticed in last week's quiz answers uh, across the board is um, some of our responses lack citing the text. And I know I didn't necessarily give instructions to do that on the first quiz, but rule of, uh, rule of thumb moving forward, you always cite the text. You always cite the text. If you have a paper, a quiz, or an assignment related to a text in any class at the college level, you should always refer to and cite that text in your answers. Your professors always want to see that, especially in writing courses like this or courses that are, are rooted in reading and writing. So make sure you cite the text. And below that, I have in-text citations. And so if you're, if you're a little unsure about how to do that or you struggle with citing the text or you need um, further guidance and help with citing the text effectively in your written responses, uh, later today, I'm going to highlight a couple of pages from They Say, I Say that teach you how to do that, that give you strategies about how to do that, and even academic language and templates that, that show you how to cite the text effectively in your written responses. So for Friday's quiz, make sure you cite the text. Um, if you don't, you're not going to get full credit for your written responses. Um, below that, going back to in-text citations, um, with the MLA format, there's a way that we do that. And the way you do an in-text citation is if you don't mention the author in a sentence and you're referring or paraphrasing from a particular text um, to avoid plagiarizing and to give credit where credit is due, what you need to do is before your end punctuation mark, in parentheses, it's the author's last name and page number 
that you got that information from. So here are in parentheses, I've written Gladwell 5, um, just as an example, if you were to uh, refer to page 5 of the text or paraphrase information from page 5, before your end punctuation mark in the sentence that you write, in parentheses, it's the author's last name followed by a page number. Now, if you mention the author's name in the sentence that you write, for example, if you start a sentence, Malcolm Gladwell states, comma, quotation, then you don't need to put his last name in the parenthetical in-text citation. All you need to do in that case is if you mention the author in the sentence that you write, in parentheses before your end punctuation mark, it's just the page number in parentheses ending punctuation. Now, I explained that very briefly along with the pages that I will highlight and they say, I say later, which I will be sending in an email. I will also give you a guide um, that goes over in-text citations and that um, reiterates the, the information that I just gave you in this video lecture. So again, if you struggle with citing the text in text citations, look for the email later today in which um, I will give you further guidance and some sources that you can refer to. So you're prepared moving forward in this class and ready for Friday's quiz to respond in a scholarly and academic manner. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that for today. Um, again, I hope you're, you're enjoying the book. I'm really excited to, to share this book with you guys and, and, and help you better understand it or to work with you in this book over the next couple weeks. So I hope you find something, at least one, one thing that you can relate to or enjoy um, in your reading. So please, as always, if you have any questions about today's lecture or um, the submission of work, your Google document, Feel free to email me leading into Friday's class. After this week, I'm going to expect us all to understand um, more or less how to submit work um, and how to, how to do well in this class, how to succeed. Um, as far as your individual success in this class is concerned, I'm going to expect us all to understand how to do that moving forward. So please, if you still have questions, this week is the time to ask me and feel free to email me. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Have a great day and rest of your week.